With tensions rising around the globe, the president will make a direct plea to the American people, saying there's an urgent need to keep money flowing to Israel and Ukraine. He can't seize his neighbor's territory and get away with it. It's as simple as that. And they're going to stay the course. They're going to continue to provide military equipment so that Ukraine can defend itself and its territory and its freedom, including additional resources that the Congress is going to give me today of $13 billion more dollars. Since the war began, the U.S. has committed more than $113 billion in assistance to Ukraine. Well, President Biden is sending Congress an urgent request for military aid to support Ukraine and Israel in the respective war efforts. Now, according to multiple reports, the request is expected to be for just around $100 billion, $60 billion going to Ukraine, about $10 billion for Israel, and the rest going to Taiwan and to support the U.S.-Mexican border. America stands behind Israel, period. I also asked her whether America could afford to support two foreign wars at the same time, and a similarly clear answer to that, absolutely. So you're a politician and you have a problem. You only make $174,000 a year. You're basically in poverty, I mean, come on. Your salary is even less than what the average doctor makes in the US. And they're not saving the country like you are. As the savior of the nation, you need to be paid handsomely. But how are you going to do that? Well, even though you may not have a big salary, what you do have is insider knowledge and influence. Now all you have to do is learn how to monetize that influence. Because listen, there is no guarantee you're going to be in office forever. So you've got to make the most of your time and power. You got to milk it for all it's worth, like these public servants. If these guys can go into office broke and come out multi-multi-millionaires, why can't you? And one of the best tools at your disposal that you can profit from is foreign aid. Ah yes, Americans are suffering, but everyone around the world deserves a little democracy, wouldn't you agree? We all know that most foreign aid is BS, but how and how can you benefit from it? Well, to find out, I decided to ask an insider. This is Sean Spicer, and he's as much of a Washington insider as you can get. He served as the White House Press Secretary and Communications Director under Trump, so he has seen it all. And now he's dedicated his life to exposing how the system actually works. He recently launched the Sean Spicer Show on YouTube, we'll link it below. So sit back, relax, and let's learn how to skim off of foreign aid. If you're like the US government and you ship stuff to other countries or domestically, then you gotta check out ShipStation. Did you know that over 50% of negative reviews come from shipping problems like shipping delays? Yes, that is right, 50%. So if you have a business that ships stuff, one of the best things you can do to grow your business, make more money while reducing your stress, is by using today's sponsor, ShipStation. ShipStation helps you automate most of your manual shipping work while also hooking you up with the best shipping rates out there with up to 89% off from top carriers like UPS, USPS, and DHL Express. Joe Rogan's on a brand used ShipStation along with 130,000 other companies. And if you want to give it a try, you can get started with a free trial in less than 5 minutes with the link below. All you gotta do is create an account, then you connect your merchant accounts like Shopify, eBay, Etsy, or Amazon. Most marketplaces and stores are supported. And finally, you connect your shipping carrier account or you choose a new carrier. And that is it. Now you can ship stuff way quicker with less headache. This includes instant tracking updates, a tool for carrier price comparison, and much, much more. So get ahead of the holiday rush while saving money on shipping by going to ShipStation.com slash JakeTrend today to get a free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com slash JakeTrend for a free 60-day trial with the link below. Let's say you're a politician and you're running for office for the first time. Well, step number one is you're going to need a lot of money. If you can't raise money, it doesn't matter. It, it, you can argue all day long whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or how corrupting it is. It's a, it's a truth. Campaigns cost money. They cost a lot of money. You need to pay for a staff. You need to pay for get out the vote efforts. You need to pay for political mail, polling. Uh, TV ads, internet ads, a website, emails, all of those things cost money and they're costing more and more. For context, if you want to become a senator, you're going to need to spend an average of $15 million. And where are you going to get that 15 mil? Well, you definitely don't have that kind of money yourself. You're probably still paying off your student loans. So you're going to have to raise it. But who are you going to raise this money from? Who is going to have millions of dollars lying around just to throw at some new politician? Well, it's going to be large corporations like BlackRock, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and so on. So what happens is, number one, you have to raise a lot of money to get elected. And you go to donors and political action committees that are companies and ask them to support you when you are running. 
Okay, great. So let's say you were able to raise a ton of money and you got elected. Great, right? Now you can finally start making a difference. Wrong. Now is not the time to celebrate and actually do anything because now you have to immediately start worrying about getting re-elected. And guess what? Getting re-elected is going to cost even more money. And who are you going to get this money from? Large corporations like BlackRock, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and so on. Now, if you get elected, then you become even more dependent on them. Why? Because it's not just your own re-election. But as you want to climb the ranks in Washington, D.C., well, hey, I want to get on this committee. I want to become a chairman on this committee. Well, you know, the more you help your other colleagues and help the team out, that's going to be seen as a positive for you. So what do you do? You want to raise more money. You want to give more money to the party, to the leadership, to your fellow colleagues, all of that stuff. And so what does that mean? That two, three nights a week when you're in Washington, D.C., you're raising money, you're hosting fundraisers, you're attending fundraisers for somebody else. Uh, it is a unbelievable critical component of being in office and getting in office. Because guess what? If you want to raise more money from the same people, you're going to have to start returning some favors. You're going to have to show them some results. Taking money from donors is kind of like if you were to run a startup and take money from investors. Now you got to answer to your investors. You got to answer to your figurative board of directors. If you're in office, unless you plan on retiring, getting reelected is probably your top priority. How do you get reelected? One, you make sure that you keep the folks that elected you to know what you're doing, that they're happy, they think that you're accomplishing stuff. Now, hopefully, in many cases, those issues align, that something that you supported, people who, who agree with your position are backing you. So it's not as corruptible as like, I'm going to flip my position because you gave me money. Usually people who agree with you on a particular position want you to stay in power so that they'll support you. So if you believe, let's say that you are a, a, a big hunter and a big supporter of the Second Amendment, well, then you're going to go to the NRA, U.S. Concealed Carry Association, and people who support Second Amendment rights and say, hey, would you be willing to continue to donate with me? Could you have a fundraiser for me? Could you send out a solicitation for me? But it's, it's, it is a constant battle once you get in office to raise enough money to stay in office. And so you are constantly thinking of the people that supported you, and there's no question about it. And what is the one thing that all the biggest corporations and defense contractors that donate to politicians all want? They all want more foreign aid. Right now, you've got a lot of arms, ammunition, military equipment that's being spent. And Biden's own State Department put out a report talking about the massive corruption that's in there. So you say to yourself, well, then why? And I think part of this comes back to there are people that benefit from this. There are people that make a ton of money. So I've always said, Jake, that two things are always at the root of everything, power and money. And when you look at what's going on in a lot of foreign policy, somebody's benefiting. And what's happening in Ukraine is 90% are plus of the aid is in the form of munitions. We're sending them a weapon system, a plane, a gun, ammunition. Well, who is making that? The defense industrial complex. Somebody back here, a defense contractor, a munitions supplier is making it. America has sent more than $75 billion in aid to Ukraine since the war began. More than 60% of that has been in the form of weapons or money specifically earmarked for buying weapons and military supplies. And who's manufacturing all these weapons, ammo, and equipment for Ukraine? Why, it's the American military industrial complex, of course. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, and so on. The same thing with Israel to some degree. We're supplying things for their Iron Dome. We want them to have the weaponry. In Ukraine, we're sending a lot of stuff over there. And then, by the way, dirty secret, we've got to resupply it here. So if we send them 10 guns, right, somebody built and spun those, but then we've got to fill the coffers with 10 more guns. Somebody's making money off of that. And that's where, you know, the dirty little secret is somebody is benefiting. The more foreign aid America sends to Ukraine and Israel, the more money American defense contractors stand to make. So if you're looking to get campaign donations from a powerful donor like Raytheon or Boeing, well, they are only going to support your cause if you support their cause. I mean, these folks, the military industrial complex spends a lot of money making sure that members of Congress that are for them stay in office. So there's two things. One is direct contributions. The other thing is they employ a lot of people and they can inform those people who's been friendly to them. So if your job, if you have a job at Boeing or Lockheed Martin or wherever, and you're being told, hey, Congressman X or Senator Y has been particularly helpful to us. They're good for us. They're good for your job. Well, guess what? That ensures that they get, they get to stay in office. So they do everything from direct contributions contributions to making sure that the employees, their families, their communities, everybody knows who's been helpful to them as a company. Your job, your future, your lifestyle relies on their success. In the 2022 election cycle, Lockheed Martin donated nearly $4 million to the campaigns of dozens of Congress members. 
if they're voting your way, if they're supporting the policies, if they're advancing the legislation, or they're getting the appropriations for the things that your company, your industry cares about, you're gonna wanna see them stay in office. What does that mean? It means that you're gonna host a fundraiser for them. You're gonna attend a fundraiser for them. You're gonna do what you can to make sure your employees know that. They'll even shamelessly donate to your campaign at the exact same time you're discussing possible foreign aid bills. But it's not just the obvious military contractors that profit off of supporting wars. It's also big money firms like BlackRock, Vanguard, and so on. Put yourself in the shoes of one of these giant investment firms like BlackRock. Or imagine yourself as one of these big investors like Ken Griffin or Bill Ackman. As one of these giants, you are always looking for guaranteed wins. You're looking for big investments where there's zero risk which is where places like Ukraine come in. Sure, on the outside, Ukraine looks like the riskiest investment ever. Why would you want to invest in a country that is at war with Russia? But think about it. If you know the US is gonna unconditionally support Ukraine to the ends of the earth. The fact of the matter is that I believe we'll have the funding necessary to support Ukraine as long as it takes. If you know that you can influence all the US politicians to keep supporting Ukraine, then an investment into Ukraine is the most guaranteed investment you could have ever asked for. What investment is better than one that is backed by the U.S. government? If they know that if they invest and that the U.S. is going to be sending money, I mean, think about it, it's a guaranteed win. On top of that, Ukraine has been decimated. They barely have an economy, which means you'll be getting in on this investment at the literal ground floor. Your investment can't go down because there's no more down to go. It's like if you were to buy a stock when the stock price is at zero dollars. Why do you think in June 2023, BlackRock and JP Morgan announced the creation of a reconstruction bank for Ukraine? Their aim was to quote, attract billions of dollars in private investment to assist rebuilding projects in the war-torn country, end quote. And all they asked for in return is to be able to get the first divs on future investments in Ukraine. Wow, how nice of them. Why do you think Ukraine's president recently had a secret meeting with people like Ken Griffin, Bill Ackman, BlackRock Vice Chairman Philip Hillebrand, and a bunch of other finance big shots? The meeting even included ex-U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. These big money names are investing in the seed round of Ukraine, which means they're going to need you, congressmen, to support Ukraine no matter what. So if you are getting ahead of the game, knowing that you can't lose in a particular investment because the U.S. is sending funds and munitions, etc., they can start to play both ends of the spectrum, right? So they can be supporting the politicians. They can be supporting and investing in the defense industrial complex on one side of the ocean. And then they can be going over the other side of the ocean and being the beneficiaries of their somehow through an investment. They are con constantly looking for ways to maximize an investment. And I think there's no question they're doing it here in the United States in terms of politicians and positions and what they invest in. And then I guess the idea is you look overseas and figure out who's going to benefit. If you know that the U.S. government is going to invest $2 billion, $10 billion anywhere, and you can go plant your flag and say, great, we'll be the ones that invest here and build here. You get to double dip. You get to invest in the company here in the U.S. that's being backfilled by the United States government. And then you go to the other side of the coin and you become the recipient of that investment through an investment that you make over there. There's no question about it. Now you may be saying, but Jake, there's got to be at least some politicians that are supporting Ukraine and Israel because they actually believe in it, right? And yes, there is some truth in that. In the case of Israel in particular, it's very personal for a lot of folks. There's a huge Jewish population in a lot of districts. But then there's also the, I mean, Israel is our greatest friend in the Middle East. So there's a big strategic value in continuing to support Israel that I think a lot of these members see. In the case of Ukraine, as I said, it's twofold. One, you've got people who recognize the threat that an, a continuing encroaching Russia poses on Europe and the freedom there. And that is a big problem because here's the thing, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Why does that matter? Well, Article 5, of NATO says that an attack on one is an attack on all. So let's say that Russia, instead of Ukraine, goes somewhere else and attacks a NATO country. By the treaty that we have signed on to, we need to go in and support that country. So if we don't stop Russia's aggression in terms of Ukraine, when they go somewhere else that's a, a NATO member, suddenly we are obligated under Article 5 of NATO's treaty to come in and support that. That's boots on the ground, our troops over there in Europe pushing back in Russia. So the idea, first and foremost, is if we stop Russia now, and then it sends a signal, don't go any further. Secondly, if we don't stand up for them, then what signal does that send to China? What signal does that send when they go want to take over Taiwan? For most of these members of Congress, in this particular case, I think that they are mostly drawn because they want to support Ukraine as a check against China, 
China or because they don't want to see an advancing Russia. But then there's going to be some that, that are looking at it. And also, I mean, in the back of their mind, there is an aspect of this, which is, hey, by the way, when we replenish all of these things that are getting sent over to China, it's actually creating U.S. jobs in my district because they're buying this weaponry, etc. So as you can see, there are many motives at play here, some legit, many not legit. But even if you're not able to profit off of Israel and Ukraine directly, fear not because we still have many more options to get rich. The average member of Congress, and I'm not talking about president or senator, but just your average House of Representatives member, it's something like 12 times richer than the average American household. Once people get elected, they almost always get richer. The average member of Congress, I think, I think it was in 2014, uh, became a millionaire. And so I think that the gap has widened. Uh, and uh, in the last four decades, uh, the average member of Congress has something like doubled their net worth, while the rest of us are kind of treading water or maybe even going backwards in some cases. The next option you have to make money is a classic, influence peddling. And the greatest master at this were by far the Bidens. The stuff that Hunter Biden has done, I think has exceeded any amount of grifting that I've seen in the past. The idea that you're sitting on the board of a company, Burmisima in particular, that he had zero qualifications. I mean, he's not an energy guy, right? He doesn't have any foreign policy experience and they're paying him a massive amount every month. Why? They admit it, it was a grift. They knew that his father had was vice president at the time and they're putting him on the board. Then he's getting all these contracts from China, et cetera. Yeah, there's no question. That is the definition of influence peddling, that this is what they were getting for. They, they make no bones about it. And then you can also use your position of power to get better loans or access the capital that the plus would never be able to get. Take Joe Biden, right? He's been in, in, in government for 50 years and suddenly he's got a couple million dollar beach house. Well, how does that happen? You know, I wrote a book called Radical Nation where I talk about his brothers and, you know, they're getting loans that none of us would ever qualify for. Um, and so you can get, they use their access, uh, not just them, but sometimes family members to get access to capital uh, and funding that, that the normal person wouldn't. Access to capital and loans. Are, are these banks do, or these lenders doing that because they know they might get some ancillary benefit from giving them the money? 100%, of course they are, right? They know who, who, who regulates them. They know who passes legislation and laws that affect them. So there's no question about it. And I mean, this, this has been going on for, you know, and, and once in a while, Congress will try to strengthen its ethics rules and police itself. You, you read story after story of politicians who got sweetheart deals, sweetheart loans, and it's not just the, the number. There are times when you would wonder how could someone qualify maybe for a loan of X amount that they wouldn't normally based on their salary or their assets. And well, gee, just so happens they're on the banking committee. And of course, there's the stock trading. And then you've got a lot of members of Congress in the last couple of years who've got busted trading stock. So, you know, it's not insider trading per se, but there is a an aspect of it where if you know legislation is going to affect a particular industry or there's going to be a regulatory action and you could go out and buy that stock because you know that a committee is going to investigate something, there's going to be fines. Uh, you can bet on things that you know are going to go up and you've seen Congress try to police itself. There's a, an act called the Stock Act. But for a lot of these guys, they're able to make investments and do things. And if not them, then maybe their wife, maybe their kid goes out and makes an investment or does something that benefits uh, the family. And obviously, if you think about it, you, you, they, that person have access to information that none of us do. They know what the government's going to do that might adversely help or, or adversely hurt or help a company or an industry because of an action that the government's going to take. So if you know that, well, then you go out and you make the right bets and boom, suddenly, you know, your $10,000 becomes $50,000, the 50 becomes a hundred and the hundred becomes a million. And you go from, you know, someone coming into Congress that didn't have that much to walking out doing pretty well. With so many ways to make money, if you play your cards right, you too can walk out of public service as a multi-multi-millionaire. And being that Congress are the ones that write the laws, there is no chance in hell they're ever going to try to fix any of this. So really, the only way to stop any of this, the only way to stop all this grift, corruption, all the stock trading, is to simply have term limits for Congress people. After all, we have term limits for the president. Why don't we have term limits for everyone else? If you could only be in Congress for maybe 5 or 10 years, instead of decades like today's career politicians, it would be impossible for them to accumulate all this corrupt wealth. But is there even a slight chance we would ever get term limits? 
Do you think there's ever a chance of getting term limits for Congress people? You know, I don't. Sean goes over his take on term limits in a new debate on his channel that you can watch right now by clicking the card on the screen. In this debate, they talk about whether or not it's even ethical to limit who people can vote for and whether or not Congress would ever actually police themselves like this. It's a great discussion. If you thought Sean was insightful in this video, then you are going to love his channel. So click the card on the screen to watch now and don't forget to subscribe to his channel as well. Stay dangerous and we'll see you in the next one.